And the next problem is number 23. And that says to find the exact value of log base 10 of 20 plus log base 10 of five. So once again, since those logarithms are added together, we can join them into one by multiplying what is in them and putting them into a single log base 10. And then 20 times five is 100. So this works out into log base 10 of 100. And in order to find out what a logarithm is equal to, you need to think of what power would change the base of the logarithm into the value that's in the logarithm. So what power would change a 10 into a 100? And the answer would be a power of two. So the answer is two. And then next we have problem number 24. It says negative three x minus one plus two x equals seven parentheses x minus six minus three. So I need to distribute the negative three. So I've got negative three x, negative three times negative one is positive three plus two x equals seven times x is seven x, seven times negative six is negative 42 minus three. Combine the like terms, you'll get negative x plus three equals seven x minus 45. Now I'm going to <clears throat> add an x to both sides. Three equals eight x minus 45. Now I'm going to add 45 to both sides. And I'll get 48 equals eight x divided both sides by eight. And then you get six equals x. So the solution is six. Next, we have problem number 25. And it says, given, <clears throat> given that negative three is a zero, um, find all the zeros of the function two x to the third minus 14x plus 12. So that's the way the problem was written. Given that that's a zero, find all the zeros of the function that is given. However, though, before I do the problem, though, I'm going to write what's missing in the problem. This is important to understand. This problem has a 2x cubed, but it has no x squared in it. So if, the, if you do this kind of problem and there's nothing of a certain kind of a term, you need to remember mentally in your head at least that there's a zero for that term. So I'm gonna think of this problem as being two x to the third plus zero x squared minus 14 x plus 12. And then this is how you do it. You write down the zero that's given to you off to the left, and then you write down the number in front of each remaining part of the problem, which is called the coefficient. So you put the two, and then the zero, this is why the zero matters. And then the negative 14, and then the positive 12. And then you start the process by bringing down the very first number again. But then you multiply and you add. So multiply these together, you get negative six, add this up, you get negative six, because zero plus negative six is negative six. Then you multiply these, and then you add. Multiply those. And then you add, and sure enough, you get zero. So if you get zero, that means the problem breaks down into being one level lower than it was before. So instead of being two x to the third, now it's only two x squared minus six x and plus four. And we're trying to set it equal to zero and solve that. <clears throat> so by the way, when we get zero for the answer, this proves that x equals negative three is the, is the first answer. So one of the answers that we get is x equals negative three. So let's put a box around that. Then what are the other answers? Well, we have to solve this. So we notice that we can factor two out of this. 
So it's always good to factor out the greatest common factor first. And then to factor the rest of it, we can break apart the x squared into two different x's like that. And then notice that if you think of two numbers that multiply to equal two and that add to equal negative three, it could be negative two and negative one. So negative two times negative one equals positive two. This times this equals this. And that negative two plus negative one equals negative three, which equals that. So that means we've factored it out and said each factor that has an x in it equal to zero. Solve it for x. So x equals two and x equals negative one. Now there's really three answers though. There's this one as well at the top. So the answers are x equals negative three and negative one and positive two. Now let's do problem number 26. So this is the sum from k equals zero to three of the value three k minus three. So this is like saying when you're zero years old that you plug zero into this formula, three times zero minus three, and then you become one year old and you keep on growing. So I think of this bottom number in this, in this series as being where you are when you start, then you travel down this pathway and tell you this old. So we're going from age zero to age three. So when we're age one, we're gonna plug one in for K into that formula. And when we're two, we're going to plug two in for that formula for K. And then when we're three, we're going to plug in three where the K is. So we're gonna use that formula each time from k equals zero and one and two and three. And then each time we do it, we're gonna get something different. So three times zero minus three is negative three. Three times one minus three is three minus three is zero. Three times two is six, six minus three is three. Three times three is nine and nine minus three is six. Now the very last thing you do at the end to find out the answer is you add them all up. So negative three plus zero plus three is zero and zero plus six is six. So the answer to the whole problem is equal to six. Then let's do number 27. It says y to the power of two thirds minus five y to the power of one third plus four equals zero. So notice that you can break apart a y to the two thirds into being y to the one-third times y to the one-third, because one-third power of y times one-third power of y equals y to the power of two-thirds. And then you bring down that first sign, multiply this sign times this sign, negative times positive is a negative. And then now we need to find um, a pair of numbers that comes from this first number times this last number, one times four, and we need to find a pair of numbers from that that adds up to negative five. So one and a four would work if I just put a, let me do those blue boxes again. I need to think of something to put in those boxes that comes from one times four that would add up to negative five. And it would just be four and one. Because with the negative signs there, it would be a negative four plus a negative one equals a negative five. Then I'm gonna set each factor that I have equal to zero. So I go one, y to the one third minus four equals zero. And then I get y to the one third minus one equals zero. So y to the one third, if I move the negative four over, it'd be a positive four. And then y to the one third, if I move the negative one over, it'd be a positive one. And then in order to move the power from one side to the other, you have to flip the power over. So y equals four to the three over one and y equals one to the power of three over one. There we go. So three over one is three, so y equals four to the third. Three over one is three, so y equals one to the third. So four to the third is 64, and one to the third is one. So the answers are 64 and one. Then let's do problem number 28. 
gives me a sequence of numbers, one, four, seven, 10, et cetera. And it says, find the 101st term of this sequence. The 101st term of that sequence is what? Well, this is very interesting. <clears throat> so first you have to notice how much is being added each time to get to the next term. So one to four is, is, is adding three. Four to seven is also adding three and so forth. So in order to get to the second term, you have to add three once. In order to get to the, um, let's say the 10th term, you'd have to add three nine times. In order to get to the 101st term, you'd have to add three 100 times, right? You'd have to add three 100 times onto the beginning, right? Well, what is the beginning? The beginning is the number one. So that means the 101st term is equal to the beginning term, which is one, plus three, which is how much of a gap there is between the numbers, you'd have to add three a hundred times in order to get to the hundred and first term. So this would be one plus three hundred equals three hundred and one, like that. Now let's do problem 29. So this problem says that the top of a ladder is leaning against a house. So there's a house and there's a ladder that's leaning against it. And it's leaning against the house at a height of 12 feet. Then it says the length of the ladder is eight feet more, is eight feet more than the distance from the house to the ladder. So you don't know how far it is from the house to the ladder. So I'm going to call that X. But it says that the Length of the ladder is eight feet longer than the distance from the house to the base of the ladder. So that means the ladder is eight feet longer. In other words, X plus eight. It's eight feet longer than it is the distance from the house to the bottom of the ladder. So that's what the picture looks like. Now this is a right triangle, so we can use the Pythagorean theorem, which says that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And I'm using A, B, and C are X and 12 and X plus 8. So if I evaluate this, it'd be X squared plus 144. And to square a binomial, you can square the first term, then bring the two times the second term times the first term. So 2 times 8 is 16 times X is 16X. And then you can square the last term is 64. <clears throat> so now I'm going to move the x squared over by subtracting it from both sides. So 144 equals, then it goes on that side, there's nothing left there. So it equals 16x plus 64. Next, I'll subtract 64 from both sides. And that'll leave me with 16x equals 140, take away 60 be 80, divide by 16, so 5, x equals 5. Now that doesn't mean the ladder is just 5 feet long, that's only the distance the, from the house to the bottom of the ladder. The ladder itself is actually x plus 8. So the ladder, the length of the ladder is equal to 5 plus 8 which is 13 feet. So the answer to the problem is the ladder is 13 feet long. Now last, the very last problem I'm gonna do on this review, 30th question, which is all the questions I can think of that I've seen on the final so many times before, it is graphing. And this time it's graphing a polynomial. So this one says f of x equals negative four times x plus five, parentheses, x minus three and x plus one squared. And that says each x-intercept must be plotted 
and that says use the multiplicities of the zeros and the leading coefficient test to determine end behavior of the graph and the sign of the function between each x intercept. So what does that mean? So that means <clears throat> that if I look closely at this, this number that's at the very front, it's called the leading coefficient. And if it's negative, if the leading coefficient is negative, that means the right side of the graph is negative as well. So we're gonna draw a graph and on the right side of the graph, we're gonna make a negative sign. Then this per next parentheses right here, x plus five to the power of one, that power is invisible, but it's one. That means that x equals negative five with the multiplicity of one. So I'm gonna say m1 for multiplicity one. The next parentheses means that x equals three, and it also has an invisible power of one. So I'm gonna say that x equals three with a multiplicity of one. And the last parentheses is x plus one, which means that x equals negative one. But that last parentheses has a power of two. So that means that negative one has a multiplicity of two. What does a multiplicity mean? Well, first let's label each of those x-intercepts. So on the x-axis, at negative five, one, two, three, four, five, I have an x-intercept. And I'm gonna label that negative five. I'm gonna say M1 beside it, just to remind myself that it, that has a multiplicity of one. And then one, two, three. I'm gonna have an x-intercept of three. I'm gonna say label that multiplicity one. And then I have an x-intercept of negative one. So I'm gonna to go to negative one and label that one multiplicity two. Well, what is the difference? Well, there's only one major difference, which is that if the multiplicity is an, is an any odd number, like one, that the graph will change signs when it gets to that point. So the graph is gonna change signs when the multiplicity is one because one is an odd number. However, if the multiplicity of an x-intercept is an even number, then the graph does not change signs at that point. So since negative one has a multiplicity of two, which is an even number, the graph is going to stay the same at that point. So the graph is gonna change signs when it gets to those other two points, but the graph is gonna stay the same sign when it gets to the middle point at negative one. So let's see what that means. Well, the graph on the right side is negative. And if you change signs from negative, then it'll be positive when you cross over that blue dot. So the graph is gonna look like this. It's negative at first, and then it crosses over this blue dot and it becomes positive. And then it crosses over this dot, except it stays the same sign that it was before after that dot. So it's actually gonna be positive again. So that means it bounces back up and comes to this next point. And then at that point, there's a C, it changes signs. Well, if it's already positive and it changes signs, then it would have to change signs to become a negative. So the graph actually crosses through that dot and goes back to being negative again. So that's the way the graph looks like, is it bounces back at the middle point, but at the other two points, it crosses through. So we're finished with the graph of that. We have labeled each x-intercept clearly and we have used multiplicities of zeros and we've used the leading coefficient test to determine the end behavior at the right side of the graph. So, and also the sign of the function between each of the x-intercepts. And we showed whether the graph crosses through each of the x-intercepts or whether it turns around and bounces back. So this is the end of the college algebra final exam review. There is a likelihood there will be some other questions on the final that I did not cover on this video if it's in a standardized final for other colleges. But no matter what college you're at, it should this should be a lot of the questions that are on a typical standardized college algebra final. And good luck to you, and God bless you. I hope you do very, very well.